Good morning. We are live from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square as a part of our ongoing series, NASDAQ Reads, featuring books and written works that exhibit innovation, entrepreneurship, and startup themes that any business can leverage. And joining us today for a special interview, we have Chris Zook, who is the author of The Founder's Mentality, How to Overcome Predictable Crisis of Growth. The book empowers executives with the necessary mindset to safely steer their company through every stage of growth past the inevitable crisis of internal complexity that follow. Chris, welcome to NASDAQ. Thanks very much for having me. Absolutely. So what is the founder's mentality? You know, about, about five years ago, we began a major study around the world, 40 countries, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies, uh, in which we were asking the question, what is it now that drives sustainable, profitable growth in a world where only one in 10 companies achieves that? And we found something that was really remarkable and really surprised us. And that was that only uh, that about, when, when you actually separated out the companies where the founder is still running the business or deeply involved in it, mm -hmm. the performance, 15 year shareholder return was 3.1 times better wow. than all the others. So then we stripped out, we saw maybe this is Silicon Valley phenomenon. And so we stripped out the tech companies. We took out Facebook, we took out Google, we took out Elon Musk. Mm. And it was still two and a half times better. Wow. And so we drilled further down and we said, is it just the genius of these amazing founders like Les Wexner or Larry Page? And certainly that's a massive part of it. However, what we found is that below the surface, there were three behaviors that were consistent across the great founders wow. that they infused into the company. They kept the company young and alive w often when they left if those behaviors remained. And we called that set of attitudes and behaviors the founder's mentality. And now we're going to touch on those behaviors a little bit later. Why is it cr critical excuse me, for companies to adopt or reconnect with a founder's mentality today? Well, the elements of the founder's mentality are very important right now because the cycle times of business are shortening. Sure. And we find that young companies are growing faster. Older companies are, are growing more slowly. And we find that when you lose the founder's mentality, uh, bad things happen. One, one amazing statistic that also came out of our work is that right now, breakdowns outside in the marketplace by major companies, 85% of the time, traced not to things on the outside world, a market that's saturated, technology that's impossible to get, government regulation, you can imagine the whole list, slowdown in the economy. They actually trace to internal factors deep th in the company, just like for humans. You know, if things go wrong with our performance, outside, so often they trace the things inside. And when we actually traced it down, we found that an overwhelming number of the internal breakdowns that ultimately led to problems outside mm -hmm. related to these three elements of the founder's mentality. So what would you say is an example of the founder's mentality that's maybe currently in headlines or in the news that we can point to? One thing that's in the news is, uh, you know, we see a lot of problems with, uh, uh, with Twitter, mm -hmm. with the founder coming back. Mm -hmm. So we looked at uh, situations where the founder comes back. And, uh, and, and exa you know, examples you know, are, are, are many, right. Starbucks to Home Depot yeah. to Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and we found that about two thirds of the time, the founder actually was able to reinfuse into the business mm -hmm. these elements of the founder's mentality and rejuvenate it. But in a third of the time, that was not possible. So an example in the news that's a very positive one would be the, you know, when, when Bob Iger was hired years ago as CEO of uh, Disney, Disney yep. you know, he went back to the core, he purchased Marvel, he purchased Pixar, he even found the original rabbit character in the first movie <laughs> and bought the rights to that that yeah. Disney had lost. Yeah. And he brought back a lot of the original values of Walt Disney. Right. And I think it's a reason why people are so concerned about his departure, because he really got it. He really got the founder's uh, mentality in a very deep way. Earlier you mentioned the three um, crisis of growth that every company will face and need to navigate, what are those? Sure. I mean, just like in, in our human lives, adulthood has a predictable crises. Sure. We found that the same was actually true with uh, businesses and that we found that three crisis points or, I guess, inflection points in the life cycle of companies, which as they get shorter and shorter, the sense of a life cycle becomes more and more important, drove about 85% of the big swings, ups and downs in the market value of these companies. And the three were number one, the period that we called, uh, the crisis we called overload, which is a rapidly growing company that, that briefly hits the wall for some reason. It, that crisis would be overload, yeah. or that breaks through it, as Facebook, uh, Facebook did, for example. The second crisis is the more profound one, 
hit, that hits more companies. Mm -hmm. It is stall out. You know, what happens when a very large company begins to see its growth rate gradually slow down? And we found that very large companies that see their growth rate slow down from high numbers to zero, market value often goes down 70%, like we saw with Starbucks wow. and so many others in the past. Yeah. Um, that we called stall out. And we found that two thirds of large companies over the course of 15 years mm -hmm. will experience that, and that only about one in six actually will ever recover their momentum. And that the majority of those that do, these elements of the founder's mentality were critical. And the third crisis was what we called free fall. You know, this is a company that <coughs> really is seeing its business model decay rapidly. Blockbuster video years ago. Sure. You know, maybe you could say BlackBerry, you know, has some aspects of his business model that's problematic. And there are elements of businesses where those profound tectoral shifts happen mm -hmm. in the company that you could refer to as free fall. Those are the three crisis moments in the lives of companies where the decisions and actions taken drive 85% of the uh, value. How can business leaders then recognize whether the company is, is experiencing these three choke points, if you will? Sometimes in the marketplace on the outside, but quite honestly, a lot of the first predictors in the signs are on the inside. Yeah. And those are the ones that are harder to see because boards of directors track the outside indicators of revenues and market share. Uh, management tracks those much more profoundly. Mm -hmm. But internally, we found there are a number of things. You know, one, is a sense of, uh, of, of loyalty of the key employees. Sure. Right now in America, this is an amazing statistic to me, only 13% of people, 13, say they have any emotional connection to the company in which they work and where they spend most of their, most of their time. And we also found that if you do have that connection, that you are willing to invest by a factor of five your own personal time in serving customers sure. or in innovating or solving problems. I mean, imagine a company that has that to 100% and one that has it in as a bureaucracy and might have it at zero. Certainly. That's profoundly different. So I would say, you know, just a few indicators, employee loyalty, ability to attract and retain the best young talent, uh, feedback loop so you really understand what frontline employees are saying, mm -hmm. customer loyalty, particularly in the fastest growing segments, yeah. and the ability to um, anticipate and be faster in product introductions than young insurgent competitors. You know, large companies that may be in danger of stall out often are beginning to uh, stall out because they encounter insurgent competitors in the market. I mean, think of Sony versus GoPro, yeah. founded by a surfer. You know, Sony should have, you would say, should have noticed that small cameras, digital cameras to photograph you surfing or skiing was an incredible idea. Yeah. And, and they didn't, and they didn't. What are some examples of companies who have used the founder's mentality, applied it, and been able to kind of reverse the direction that they were heading uh, towards one of those choke points, if you will? Sure, I mean, the, the best known example is, is Starbucks. Yeah. You know, I mean, everybody knows it, but maybe that's a good reason yeah. to use it briefly. Sure. Uh, you know, when Howard Schultz came in, there were many possible reasons why Starbucks market value had gone down 85%. Mm -hmm and why same-store sales were suddenly negative. You could say the market saturated, people are going elsewhere for coffee to designer places, you know, many, many other reasons. Yeah. But when he came in, he said, you know what? It's 100% self-inflicted wounds. He had an amazing phrase that, that talked about unraveling a sweater inch by inch, decision by decision. And all the actions he took were to rejuvenate the sense of the store, rejuvenate the coffee experience, mm -hmm. take the baristas out behind huge machines that were there for their productivity, right. take out a lot of the clutter in the stores, close the bad ones that had, that had begun with no soul, and uh, go back to the original heart and soul of the company. And, and the company now, the stock price is three times what it was in the last 10 years from its previous peak, just from, uh, just from doing that. So I mean, the, the potential to renew companies, Lego, would be another example of a company that massively renewed itself sure. over the last uh, 10 years and is one of the great, uh, great renewal stories around. DaVita, which was almost a bankrupt dialysis company, uh, was, has now been, for the last uh, 15 years, the best performing healthcare company in America right. under Kent Theory, going back and basically refounding the company. You know, when you actually drill into, like Apple, the, what actually happened during the renewal, a certain amount of it was the strategy on the outside and simplification, sure. but an enormous amount of it was renewing the heart and soul uh, of the company on the inside. In doing your research for the book, you, you spoke with hundreds of leaders from around the world. What were some of those insights that stood out the most coming from those leaders? The humility of the leaders mm. and, uh, and the fact that they, even, even 
after massive success, still had incredible love of the detail. Mm -hmm. Les Wexner visiting stores. Right. Uh, M.S. Oberoi, the founder of Oberoi Hotels, you know, often thought of as one of the great hotel chains, best hotel chain in the world. Yeah. Still at age 93, holding customer cards up to his eyes when his grandson, Vikram, would visit him on Sunday morning. Wow. You know, I think, I think love and attention to detail, intellectual curiosity was, you know, one of the huge things uh, that we observed in, uh, in the great founders. Open-mindedness, yeah. humility, uh, intellectual curiosity, um, uh, aggressive and inspiring goals, distaste for bureaucracy, um, a high metabolism to not necessarily act precipitously, yeah. but to re get right on problems as they happen. Just before we wrap, where, where can everybody find your book at? Everybody can find the book at, uh, at Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday was the, the publication date. It's available sure. electronically. It should be available in uh, most bookstores. Pleasure to hear about the founder's mentality. And uh, we hope you all have, have enjoyed this segment. And go out and check out the book and pick it up.